Thank you very much. Um, so I'll be reviewing our uh, surgical series and looking at uh, leptomeningeal disease rates after a surgical resection of brain mats. I have no disclosures. So um, although surgical resection can help achieve local control for brain metastatic disease, uh, prior studies have suggested that resection may be associated with increased risk of LMD post, uh, in the postoperative period. Um, however, these highlighted risk factors for developing postoperative LMD are, are mixed across studies. Some include breast cancer histology, hemorrhagic or cystic features, for example. Um, furthermore, uh, prior studies have not examined whether risk factors are similar for linear versus nodular patterns of LMD, which have uh, recently been shown to have different clinical outcomes. Um, the study of uh, the aim of our study was to evaluate the following. Uh, first, we wanted to look at our overall LMD rates, as well as uh, classical versus nodular patterns of LMD after resection of brain metastases. Um, we wanted to identify risk factors associated with postoperative LMD using both conventional logistic regression uh, analyses as well as a supervised machine learning model. And then what we wanted to assess specifically whether performing additional cranio craniotomies or uh, treatment in the postoperative period with novel checkpoint or targeted inhibitors impacted the development of LMD. Um, this was a retrospective cohort uh, consisting of UCSF uh, patients. Uh, all of these were adult patients, and we made the reference point uh, for clinical outcomes from the date of uh, their first craniotomy for resection of a brain metastasis. They all ended up having path-confirmed malignant tissue, um, and they all underwent some form of postoperative radiotherapy, whether that was local versus uh, whole brain. Um, and they all have to have uh, some documentation of outcomes past a month. Uh, we did exclude patients that uh, underwent brachy brachytherapy intraoperatively just to make a more homogenous cohort. Uh, and um, we excluded any patients that had possible LMD diagnosed uh, prior to the date of surgery. Um, in addition to just general post-operative LMD outcomes, we uh, also tried to classify these uh, um, disease patterns as classical or nodular. You can see some examples here. So in the top row, there, uh, these are uh, examples of the classical phenotype in which there's sort of a sh sugar coating type appearance of enhancement, either in cerebellar folia, for example, or within the uh, internal auditory meatus here. Uh, whereas on the bottom is a more nodular pattern. Some can refer to this as pachymeningeal uh, disease as well. And in, in this study, we uh, termed it nodular leptomeningeal disease, which others have done as well. Um, these are just the list of uh, 25 variables, clinical patient and tumor variables that we looked at to see if they were associated with leptomeningeal disease. Again, um, importantly, I wanna just point out additional craniotomies was uh, included and these were additional craniotomies performed uh, for the purpose of resecting other brain metastases that showed up during the patient's uh, oncologic course uh, or as well as uh, treatment with novel uh, systemic therapy. So we ended up having uh, 217 patients in the cohort with 225 brain mets that were resected. Um, Follow-up was about uh, one and a half years for the entire cohort. Uh, as expected, most patients had a non-small cell lung cancer, breast or melanoma diagnosis, but we did have a scattering of other pathologies as well. Uh, most patients, as expected in the surgical cohort, only had a single MET at the time of surgery, although this, this did range, and there were some patients with multiple METs uh, at the time of surgery. Most underwent gross total resection. Most underwent focal radiation. Um, and about a fifth of the cohort underwent subsequent uh, craniotomies uh, later on during their oncologic course, and 60% underwent uh, postoperative systemic therapy with either checkpoint or targeted inhibitors um, on follow-up. So uh, our rate of postoperative LMD was 21.7%, uh, which is uh, in range of what has been previously reported. And from the time of surgery to the time of diagnosis of LMD was about uh, nine months. 
uh, our one and two year LMD survive, free survival rates were 85.6% and 71.4%. And there, um, there was a slight skewing of uh, towards a nodular pattern over a classical uh, linear pattern. I wanna direct your attention to sort of the bottom graphs in this figure. Um, we did find if we looked at uh, rates, uh, time from surgery to diagnosis of LMD, it really didn't uh, change whether we were, uh, the patient was diagnosed with classical versus nodular type patterns. Um, however, if we looked at the time from LMD diagnosis to death, uh, the nodular pattern was associated with a, a significantly increased uh, survival time of seven months versus two and a half months. And this sort of recapitulates what some other groups have also recently reported. Um, both of these uh, uh, imaging phenotypes of LMD are associated with poor prognosis. Uh, but it, it does seem like um, treatment of either improved survival on follow-up. Uh, so within the cohort uh, on the in panel A, uh, LMD diagnosis did, as expected, lead to worse survival. Uh, this was um, seen whether or not we looked at uh, classical or nodular patterns uh, separately. Um, but uh, if we looked at time from treatment, uh, time from LMD diagnosis to death, treatment increased survival, and this was um, uh, seen across uh, either the classical or nodular uh, uh, phenotypes as well. Um, we then uh, looked at both uh, Cox proportional hazard uh, analyses and the nominal logistic regression model to look at the factors associated with uh, postoperative LMD. Um, Essentially, we saw location, uh, either cerebellar, insular, or occipital location were associated with increased risk of LMD formation. An absence of extracranial disease at the time of surgery, which I'll come back to, was associated with an um, increased risk of LMD, as well as contact with the ventricle. Um, we then used a, a supervised machine learning algorithm. algorithm. This was a random force analysis uh, based off random force analysis using those 25 factors. Uh, we split our cohort up uh, into 70% training and 30% testing cohort. And in our testing cohort, we uh, were able to accurately predict uh, LMD diagnosis in 87.7% .7 of patients with an area under the curve of uh, 0 0.87. Uh, in this model, similar to the logistic re regression analyses, location and systemic disease status were uh, really important for LMD uh, diagnosis, as well as tumor volume was actually found to be a predictive of postoperative LMD. Um, we then looked at uh, factors associated with uh, classical or nodular LMD specifically and uh, didn't really see anything that was too unique. Uh, location was still important. And then for the nodular pattern, absence of extracranial disease um, was important for postoperative LMD diagnosis. Uh, so to summarize our key findings, um, overall our LMD rate was uh, just above 20% uh, in this cohort of surgical patients. Uh, the main factors associated with LMD were absence of extracranial disease at surgery. And I think this is a uh, sort of a, a survival bias issue. So these patients are probably, uh, they, they do live longer. If we look at those that have absent or present extracranial disease at surgery, uh, those that don't have any extracranial disease uh, survive for much longer. And so they probably have more time to develop uh, leptomeningeal disease. Location uh, is important, uh, which has uh, been shown by in other studies as well. Increased tumor volume, which may lead to increased risk of tumor seeding at the time of surgery and then contract, contact with the ventricle. Um, classical LMD is associated with worse prognosis, um, but both of these seem to respond to treatment. And interestingly, additional craniotomies did not increase the risk of LMD formation, which is a little bit unexpected. You'd expect if surgery were to increase your risk of LMD, you'd see it more frequently if patients were to get more craniotomies for brain met resections. So we didn't see that, nor did we see an impact of these systemic uh, therapies on the rate of LMD in these patients. 
Uh, obviously, this is uh, limited by many of the issues with retrospective studies. Um, we weren't able to really tease out from the operative notes about on block resection uh, performed intraoperatively, which is another known risk factor. But I think, uh, you know, these are on block resections usually more relevant to small METs uh, that are uh, easy to access. And then in terms of future directions, um, I think this is important to identify patients who are at increased risk uh, so that we can think about escalating therapy in these patients. For example, should preoperative uh, SRS be uh, given to these patients that may potentially be at increased risk of postoperative LMD? Should we be using uh, larger uh, radiotherapy fields uh, for patients that may be at higher risk? And then, uh, you know, I'm sure many groups here are looking at what genetic factors intrinsic to these tumor cells correlate with LMD risk in the postoperative period. Um, so that's something uh, lots of people are actively looking at. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Dars for leading this effort, uh, as well as members of the neurosurgical radiation oncology and radiology department. Definitely a team effort to get this done. Thank you.